Okay, gents, we are live. Don't even ask me which episode this is. I can't episode 28. It's 28? According to what you put on YouTube. Okay, well, hopefully I'm not a liar and I, that was actually accurate. But it really doesn't matter what number episode this is. That's not the important thing. The important thing is that today we are on with our special guest, H.K. Roy. He is the author of American Spy. I have the book right here. It was a hell of a good read. Tore through it over the last uh, week or two. Took a lot of notes, underlining passages in it. Um, HK is a retired CIA operations officer. He has extensive experience serving in the Balkans. Um, and then on the private sector side, he uh, has a company in Iraq. So as you say in the book, I'm all Iraqed out. Spent a lot of time over there as well uh, in the private sector side. but. Primarily tonight, I wanted to talk to HK about the Balkans because, I mean, he's had some terrific stories in there of, um, I mean, all sorts of different stuff, hunting down war criminals, but also that, like, good spy versus spy, like, crusty case officer stories, meeting with assets in the graveyard, literally. I mean, there's just some really great stuff in there that I wanted to get into, and also some really surprising things I learned uh, about, uh, well, Iran. Uh, being active in the Balkans, quite frankly, and HK coming into contact with those guys. But anyway, thank you, HK. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you guys for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And by the way, I'm Jack Murphy. This is my co-host, Dave Park. This is the Team House, episode 29. If 28. I'm not, 28, Yeah. if I'm not lying. Yeah. Uh, but HK, jumping right into it, and you know, you really jump right into it from the very beginning of your book. Um, can you introduce us to the Balkans? You were active there during the 1990s when things were really bad. The former Yugoslavia had broken up at the end of the Cold War. Um, introduce us to this topic because it's an incredibly complicated part of the world with an incredibly complicated history. It is very complicated, and I'll try and uh, summarize it in a pretty simple way, if possible. Uh, I first was assigned there PCS in uh, fall of 1989, which as you may recall, was when the uh, Berlin Wall came down. Now at that point, Yugoslavia had been a, not a member of the, the Soviet bloc, but uh, like a, its own, it had its own unique socialist system. Uh, so for us, it was still a denied area more or less a communist country, but not quite as hardcore as, as Russia or, or the Soviet Union or, or Bulgaria, for example. Uh, Tito had held uh, this country together by force for many years. You know, Yugoslavia was made up of six or so different republics with different ethnic groups, different religions. There were Serbs who were Orthodox, uh, Christian, Croats and Slovenes, uh, Roman Catholic, they were under the Ottoman Empire, or excuse me, under the Austro-Hungarian Empire, whereas the Serbs and the Bosnians were under the Ottoman Empire. Bosnians, uh, a lot of them are Muslim because they were uh, converted when they, 500 years ago under the, under the Turks. And you have Albanians in Kosovo, but Tito managed to hold all of this together uh, pretty well, and he outlawed, essentially outlawed tribalism and uh, ethnic hatred and that type of thing. Uh, but he died. And then uh, when I was there, I first got there in the late 89, Slobodan Milosevic was in charge. And he is sort of seen as the, the leader who, who helped break up Yugoslavia in the sense that he started stirring up ethnic passions, uh, starting with the Albanians and Kosovo. Um, and uh, at any rate, we knew from our sources and just, it was pretty easy to see that Yugoslavia was not going to stick together. It was, there was too much uh, desire on the part of the Croats and the Slovenes and others to go their own way, have their own independent republics. But official US policy initially was, we only recognize a single unified Yugoslavia, which was a nice idea if it would work, but unfortunately they were past that. And we we reported this to uh, to the you know to the administration at the time. It was a, it was the George uh, first George Bush administration. Um, I'll try and make the long story short. Um, after we James Baker came to Belgrade and 
officially said we only recognize a single unified Yugoslavia. This was in summer of 91, I believe. That, for all practical purposes, gave the green light to the Yugoslavs and the Serbs to uh, to have civil start civil war in Croatia, Slovenia, and Bosnia, which which we knew would happen. Uh, so the civil wars kicked off. We imposed an arms embargo, which only really hurt those who couldn't defend themselves as easily like the Croats and the Bosnians. And then we flip-flopped our policy and said, all right, Serbs, now you're the bad guys. Now we only recognize the independent republics. And so, um, as I say in the book, we aren't responsible for, the U.S. government is not responsible for the civil war in Yugoslavia, but our ever-changing policies certainly made things worse than they needed to be. And uh, so when I was there, it was still Cold War uh, rules. Uh, I was handling a sensitive asset. It was typical spy versus spy. If you think of the old, you know, Smiley's People type movies or the spy who came in from the cold, denied area trade craft. Uh, and then we were there and we transitioned from Cold War into a Civil War. So uh, in that sense, it was a great place to be if you were doing my job because, uh, you know, it was a pretty unique situation to go from Cold War to Civil War in Europe. It was the first uh, first uh, armed conflict in, in the heart of Europe since World War II. And I was lucky enough, really, to be uh, right in the right place at the right time. And uh, there weren't many of us there. And so that's why they continued to send me back after my two-year PCS tour from late 89 to late 91. I went right from Belgrade to Croatia because the war was just starting there. And then I uh, PCS back to the U.S., but continued to, to uh, TDY back to Croatia and Bosnia, uh, primarily to establish our first um, official service-to-service -service relationships between the CIA and the Security Service of Croatia initially. And then in that was in 92. And then in 95 with the Bosnian service they sent me to do that uh and i get into some of those stories in the book yeah. as well so, were, so that's were sort you, of uh, down i down. mean you had quite a bit of experience working in central america prior to the balkans i mean were you ever you know the serbo croat guy at the agency uh, or did, was it something you really just got thrown into the deep end so i was in latin america i was actually in uh, south america uh, for three years worked a lot on Nicaragua from there, but uh, was based in South America. And no, I spoke Spanish at the time and, and Italian, but I decided I wanted to, after my Latin America tour, that I wanted to work in the Soviet East European Division and, uh, you know, I wanted to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Ruskies, as they say in that old movie, uh, what is it called, uh, at any rate. Um, and so I was accepted to Soviet East European Division and uh, was slotted for Belgrade. I put down BE thinking I'd get East Berlin, but they gave me Belgrade instead. But, uh, and then I went to a, a much more intensive surveillance uh, training, which they give you. It was called the SCIO course, Soviet East European Internal Ops course, uh, where you are tested and trained much more than you are in the normal spy school at the, at the farm, which is very good in and of itself. But they have to be 100% certain before they send you out to a denied area that you can detect surveillance before you meet with your asset because if you uh, if you can't you will lead surveillance to your meeting and they will wrap him up and uh, likely kill him and so it's and if, if not everybody passes the course it doesn't hurt your career if you don't uh, it just means you can't see uh, surveillance but that training was intensive and it was fantastic and uh, uh, and by the time I, I went to Belgrade, I knew with 100% certainty that I could detect surveillance if it was there. Now, was, just out of curiosity, was that all surveillance detection or was it learning more also how to incorporate counter surveillance uh, and, and things like that? How to work more with... Well, we, with we also, the primary function was to be able to, to know for sure if you were under surveillance uh, before committing an operational act, but you also learn how to how to mark a signal or or operate in a window. Let's say, if you only have uh, 
you know, 10 seconds to do something as you round the corner or something. Uh, and it's also equal. So you learn how to operate while under surveillance. But the more important thing is to know whether you're under surveillance or not. And it's important uh, as well to know if you're not under surveillance. A lot of people right. will see a ghost and they think they're under surveillance and they right. abort a meeting. And what if your meeting is, is so important that, you know, you're about to collect information on an imminent terrorist attack, which occasionally, you know, happens. And you abort the meeting because you thought you had surveillance, but you didn't. So it's equally right. important to know, you know, in both directions, whether you have it or not. HK, on that note, could you tell us the story uh, in your book you call your asset Hitch, who a very high level, very important strategic asset for the United States. And you had this great story where you, fo you thought you had a ghost on your tail, so to speak. And you had to make this last minute determination, like, am I being surveilled? Am I not? Because it's so critical that you meet with this asset that there's people back in D.C. who are waiting for this information. Uh, I, I, could you tell us a little bit about that, uh, that whole experience? Yes, and that was a typical experience. That was just one out of out of many uh, cases like that. So uh, Hitch, we, we would assign uh, a cryptonym to our assets. His wasn't really Hitch. I, I chose that. For, it's an inside joke. <laughs> but um, he was a high level uh, officer in the in the SDB, which was the Yugoslav KGB, and he was our asset and had been for years. And my job, uh, my only job uh, while I was in Yugoslavia was to securely handle him and collect and report uh, high level top secret intelligence as Yugoslavia slid out of uh, the Cold War and into Civil War. His reporting was critical to our understanding of what was going on in Yugoslavia and to be able to predict what would happen in the future in Croatia and Bosnia. Uh, but, but my job was just to, to handle him securely. And initially I would meet him maybe once every two or three months. Uh, and in the interim, I would prepare for that one meeting. And um, the meeting would last five to 10 minutes. We called them brief encounters. Uh, it was after doing a, a minimum three hour SDR surveillance detection route, which was also planned out, coordinated with uh, headquarters in advance. and and. Not always a good thing when headquarters gets involved in the nitty gritty, but generally speaking, in SE division, it was it was a good thing. Uh, and so, you know, the idea is you you prepare for this meeting, and then when the night comes, you take off on your SDR. Typically, in in Belgrade in those days, there wasn't a lot of surveillance. It wasn't like Moscow where they can blanket you with you know two dozen cars, and you it's tough to see. Or even during our SEIO course training, which was much better than what I saw in Belgrade. You know, there was a couple of, if you had surveillance, it would be a couple of Ladas or Yugos with a couple of burly guys in them with leather jackets and uh, chain smoking, smoke, chain smoking, smoke pouring out of the windows. And they stood out because most Yugoslavs in those days were pretty aggressive drivers. They would sideswipe you, pass you, cut you off, flip you off and all that. These guys were hanging back a couple of courteous car lengths, you know, so <laughs> it wasn't that hard to, to pick them out. But at any rate, um, so you, I, you know, do a two hour planned SDR and, and there's, there's a whole science of how you do the SDR and get progressively more provocative. And, and you don't, unlike in the movies, you don't want to be obvious about looking for surveillance. You're not trying to lose anybody. You just want to know if it's there, but you don't want them to know that you're looking uh, because you don't want them to know that, you know, that you're an intelligence officer. And so after a couple of hours of driving, you you know, I'd be confident that I wasn't under surveillance. Uh, and then I would ditch my car, which uh, in those days had dip tags on them. Uh, and so I would ditch it in a typically in a, a parking lot. They had these big Soviet block style apartment complexes, which is thousands of cars. On the road into Belgrade. Those huge. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And so if I ditch my car there and then take off for the next hour. So the idea is if the SDB comes across my car in the parking lot, they're going to assume I'm in one of those buildings and they can spend hours looking for me. And meanwhile, I'm across town. And so uh, after I do all that, uh, and well, in the story in the book, I had done all that. And uh, I was confident that I was not under surveillance. The problem in Yugoslavia was that even if you weren't under surveillance, since they had limited resources, they would have SDB cars staked out in different parts of town, 
And then if you happen to drive past, they glom onto you. And right. so that was the risk. So you may be you may be black, which means you have no surveillance. And then uh, two and a half hours into your SDR, but then boom, they pick you up. So as I was making my final approach to my meeting site, and a meeting site is something that you know we cased and we photographed. We didn't have this was pre-internet, pre-Google, and all that. So we were our own Google Maps, our own Google Earth. We did extensive casing reports. Uh, you know, we drew our own maps, photographed the site. Um, the agent knew had the had the casing report on the site. Uh, he knew exactly what time uh, to be there. You know, you have like a one minute window, and if he's not there, or if you're not there, you you continue on your way. So, to this day, I'm very timely. <laughs> but uh, anyways, I was making my final approach to the meeting site, which happened to be in a uh, a cemetery, like in a side path down the cemetery in in, New, in Zemun, which is across the river from across the Saba River from Belgrade. Uh, not all meeting sites are in cemeteries. This this one just happened to be in a cemetery. And as it was late November, I believe, and late at night. And so, you know, when you're walking down the street and it's completely deserted, if somebody's behind you, you can hear them walking back there behind you. So as I was making my final approach, somebody was behind me. Uh, sounded like a big guy based on the, you know, the, the sound of his footfalls. And um, so I had to determine... You know, I, my my instinct told me this is just a ghost because I'm, I know I'm black, but you never know. Did I happen to walk past somebody who just picked me up? And so as I was approaching the meeting site, I had like 30 seconds left to decide whether to abort or not. And I just relied on my training and experience there. I knew it had to be a ghost. And so I peeled off towards the, the meeting site. And uh, fortunately, it was a ghost. And he continued on his way down the main path to the cemetery. And we had our had our little brand, our little meeting. And I mean, if you got it wrong, you're gonna get beat up and sent home. Uh, but the asset is done. I mean, he, he's, he's, gonna, right. he's a dead man. Exactly, so you don't wanna get it wrong. Yeah. Uh, you know, because exactly, he'd be arrested and you know, at the very least in prison for the rest of his life, maybe executed. Um, this is a guy who'd been on you know, been around for many years and, you know, he puts his life in our hands. And that's why this SEIO course training is so essential. If you can't see surveillance, you're not going. We, we owe it to our agents uh, to protect them. So what can you tell us then about this meeting in, in the graveyard? I mean, it sounds like something right out of a movie that you, you this asset was your sole responsibility. I mean, it was one case officer, one ops officer for this one asset which I think tells you how critical it was to national security. Uh, wh what's it like when you finally, after months of training, have a face-in-face -face brief encounter with this asset? Yeah, uh, that's what it's all about. It's exciting. You're, you know, I've got just a couple of minutes because you don't want to be seen on the street. You know, two guys on the street uh, in Belgrade late at night, people are suspicious. Now, sometimes he brought his wife along, and that sort of lowered the profile. But we would, I would, the first thing I would do is ask him, this is all in Serbian, by the way, I would ask him for any sort of breaking news updates that may not be in the, he, I should, I should back up. He would hand me a, like a gym bag full of a stack of top secret documents from the uh, SDB, KGB, essentially, uh, from the past couple of months. Not all agents would do that because it was too risky. We told him, you know, photograph them, but he liked to take chances and he got away with it. Uh, but, you know, you can't control the, you, like, you like to think you can control them, but you really can't. Uh, so he would hand me a gym bag full of top secret documents, all in Cyrillic and in Serbian. Um, on top, he would type out or, or handwrite out sort of his list of, uh, first of all, any, any late breaking news that aren't covered by the documents. Uh, and then he'd sort of prioritize for me what he thought would be the most important things to report uh, you know, in what order. And then I would talk to him for just five minutes or so for any late breaking news and uh, commit that to memory. And then we would uh, shake hands and go our separate ways, both both of us continuing to look for surveillance until we got back to where we were going. And so in my case, I'd have to get back to my car, first of all. And now, you know, I'm breathing a, a, a preliminary sigh of relief because I've met the agent. I didn't drag surveillance to the meeting did my job, but now I've got this 
this uh, sports bag full of top secret documents. If I'm in a car accident, I'm not so worried about being pulled over and searched. I'm worried about being involved in a car accident where I'm unconscious and the police come along and they find this bag of uh, the documents and then that'll lead back to him as well. Uh, at any rate, I worked my way back, uh, back to my house uh, across the river and uh, quickly go upstairs and by now I'm, I'm reeking of Belgrade, which in those days was polluted. Uh, they burned a lot of soft coal, so you got this yellow mist in the air and then, uh, and then they would toss their burning coal embers into these giant garbage dumpsters all around town. So you had sort of the smell of burnt garbage together with the, the coal smell. And, by the, and your clothes are just all gray after about a month there. Oof. And you just smell like Belgrade. So I get home and try not to wake my wife up, stash the bag under the bed. And then the next morning, stick it in a cardboard box um, to carry it into the case, you know, I'm under surveillance then. They, all they see me uh, is carrying a, a, a grocery box into the uh, into the office, and that's and then we it's kind of like Christmas Day. We we open up the the box, go through the documents, and uh, every time we're blown away by what he's uh, sharing with us, and it's just it's important stuff. And um, in those days, things were very low tech. We 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 thought that the Russians or the or the Yugoslavs might have some way to electronically eavesdrop on us, so we couldn't use laptops or, in those days they weren't laptops, they were, you know, but some sort of a computer word processor. So everything was handwritten, pencil and paper, uh, in a tiny little crappy little office with music blaring, uh, long, translating from Serbian into, into uh, English, and then we would hand it to our communicator, who did have a secure little booth and uh, he'd have to retype the whole thing and then and then send it out by by satellite secure, securely. And correct correct me if I'm wrong. Your asset is a member of the what was it the SPD basically the KGB in Yugoslavia. So this has that added benefit that you get to learn all the intelligence that this surveillance that that this intelligence service is collecting. You get all that information, but you also on top of that you get to know what the thinking is inside that intelligence agency and that government. So it's kind of like a two for one deal, isn't it? Exactly. So there's, there's foreign intelligence, which is we want to know sort of what the Yugoslav government has planned for Croatia. Uh, and just that, that's what we call FI foreign intelligence, but there's also counterintelligence CI. These are the guys who are, who are surveilling me and going after, you know, people in the, uh, in the American community there. And so it's, it's good, it's a good check on me. Like if I if I were ever to miss surveillance, he would be able to tell me that. And one time I did because uh, before we were getting ready to leave Belgrade, uh, I asked my wife had gone through the SEIO course as well. They were sort of required to in those days, uh, whether they like it or not. And so I said, <laughs> I said, you drive. I want to drive around Belgrade and get a videotape of our daily route to work, just to have some you know, some souvenirs uh, 20 years down the road, what Belgrade looked like. And, so, and I said, you know, watch for surveillance because I'm going to have a video camera. Okay. So we did that, and uh, she was supposed to be watching for surveillance. And it turns out she didn't see it because at my next meeting, he said, oh, by the way, we, we you know, we were surveilling you while your wife was driving, and they, they assumed you were videotaping military installations and that kind of thing. It doesn't do any good to say, but I wasn't. It was just, I was just being a tourist that day. Yeah. You know, yeah. they believe hey, what so they're going we to have, believe. Oh, sorry. Uh, we have our first super chat, our first question. It actually relates back to something that we generally ask our guests anyway, and we would have asked you eventually. But uh, thank you, Alex. And Alex asks, what is HK's origin? So we always want to know what somebody's <laughs> origin story is. What, who were you before the CI? How did you get there? Like, what, what drew you in? And also, he wants to know if you met Greg, uh, Greg Walker, while you were in, uh, well, you, he was in Central America, but you were out of South America, right? I was in South America, yeah. Right. Greg so, Walker, I don't I don't recognize the name. Yeah. But, you know, it's been many years. Yeah. So, um, uh, your origin story. Yeah, well, I, uh, I, I didn't grow up planning on joining the CIA. In fact, I probably didn't even know what it was. I grew up in the American Southwest. Um, you know, in late 60s and 70s, 
assumed I would have to go to Vietnam because that's what all the older kids in the neighborhood did. You grow up, you go to Vietnam, you go to join the army, go to Vietnam. So I was, uh, uh, you know, worried about that. I had allergies. And I, I envisioned my, my future 18 year old self on patrol in the jungle, have, you know, sneezing and <laughs> having to blow my nose on a banana leaf and betraying my squad's position to the Viet Cong who would then kill us all. And so, you know, when I, when I heard that the draft had ended, uh, I was still, you know, young teen. Uh, I was happy about that. Figured life would be pretty much smooth sailing from that point on. But uh, I, I went to uh, college in the Southwest, but then went to uh, law school in D.C. And while I was in law school, I worked for all three branches of government and uh, got a feel for the U.S. government and sort of decided in those three years that I didn't really want to work as a lawyer in a law firm. I'd like to go overseas. I had always, I had already spoken a couple of languages and grew up going to Mexico and uh, sort of love foreign cultures, foreign languages, and travel. And uh, so I heard about the CIA and the Foreign Service and I read up as much as I could in those days because again, there was no internet and you couldn't just apply online. But I heard about it and read about it and said, you know, it sounds, it sounds like a good career for me. And so I somehow made contact with them and I don't remember exactly how I did because it wasn't online, so I must have found their number in the phone book or something. But sure. got the process started, and went through the you know the process took almost I don't know less than a year, but close to a year I guess, and uh, and that's sort of how it came about. Did was there something that drew you to the CIA as opposed to the State Department or like you know the Foreign Service? You know. Yeah, it just sounded so much more fun and so much more interesting, and, and that proved to be the case 100%. So it was definitely the right choice. So I can't without, imagine having worked for the State Department. So without, like, the assets or the resources of the Internet, which now everybody, you know, anybody who has an interest in, and probably the movies too, anybody who has an interest in the CIA can read all about the farm and the type of training they get and things like that. Um, you obviously didn't have access to stuff like that. What did you think when you got to the farm? What was your experience there? Well, interestingly enough, there was one book that I read by a game, guy named uh, Philip Agee. It was called CIA Diary. This is the guy who was a CIA officer in uh, Latin America, and then he defected. to. He wrote this book, had no approval to do so. And the first 75 pages... He told everything you could possibly tell about training at the farm. So I felt like I already knew a lot about oh, it. Oh, wow. And that was the, that was the only book uh, of its kind at the time. But it was, you know, it, it paid off. Guys, again, um, we are here with H.K. Roy. He is the author of American Spy. I just read it. Highly recommend it. Um, H.K. was a CIA ops officer, if you're just joining us. He has pretty extensive experience working in the Balkans, also in Iraq, in the private sector, as he was mentioning, uh, also in South America. So we're kind of talking to him tonight about the contents of the book. And thank you, everyone who's joining us live tonight and everyone who listens to this later as a podcast or yeah. what have you. So, HK, I, the next thing I, I got to get out of you, I need to hear this just insane story that you kick your book off with about the Iranians attempting to assassinate you in Sarajevo. So, I mean, maybe if you could, you could begin because you were the first station chief of Sarajevo. They like sent you in there in the middle of a war zone with a couple army dudes to spearhead that whole effort. Yeah, so again, I was, I was based in the US at that time. This was after my Belgrade tour. This was after I had, uh, established the uh, relationship with the Croatian intelligence service or security service. Um, and so this was in July of 95. And again, there were no U.S. troops in Bosnia at the time, but things were, the Bosnian war had been raging for three years at this point. You know, you may remember from the news that there were concentration camps set up across Bosnia, rape camps, people were starving, being, you know, literally starving in Sarajevo because there was no food. The Serbs had them surrounded. Uh, honest to God, atrocities happening in, you know, in Europe in the, in the 1990s. Yeah. No, I'm going to ask and, you about that next. Yeah. And so uh, Clinton was president, and uh, it was clear that they were thinking about uh, engaging NATO, you know, militarily to stop the Serb, uh, Serb rampage. 
And so we decided after three years uh, that we needed to establish an official service-to-service -service relationship with the Bosnians. And so I was selected to go to lead that. It's supposed to be a team, me and a communicator and some uh, paramilitary guys. But for whatever reason, it was just me and the communicator. And so uh, I went to D.C. and said, all right, you know, because I, I was out of the I was in the U.S. then, but, you know, so I wasn't really keeping up with everything in the Balkans. I said, so what's the plan? How am I going to get to Sarajevo? Because it was, there was no air traffic. There was no safe way to get in and out. Um, and they said, uh, we don't know. You know, that's why, that's why we called on you. You figure it out. So I did, you know, I went to, uh, to split Croatia with my communicator. And from there, uh, yeah, this is where uh, I had a colleague in Zagreb. And he, he could tell that, you know, this was a, a mess that I was getting into. And so he, he had a couple of uh, uh, special army guys in, in Zagreb with him who he sent over to, uh, to split in the defense attaché's brand new armored Jeep Cherokee, which we destroyed. And uh, <laughs> so they came over to split uh, and we met up that night in the uh, hotel split, had a few pivos, few beers, and talked about our plans for how we were gonna get from split to Sarajevo. Uh, at the time, there were occasional UN uh, relief convoys that would go into Sarajevo. They would get shot up. The Serbs would actually shoot them with anti-aircraft guns, you know, and so uh, you, our armored Jeep was nice, but if they shoot us with an anti-aircraft gun, you know, tough luck. So that was the plan. We would just insert our vehicle into the uh, the vehicle that they brought over from Zagreb into this UN convoy, and make our way into Sarajevo. And so that's what we did. We we started off early the next morning from Split and uh, drove as far as a place called uh, Tarčin, which is a little village on the Bosnian-controlled side of Mount Igman. Mount Igman was this mountain. It, it may have been the one where they had the Olympics many years ago. I'm not sure if it's the same mountain or not, but I think it is. Uh, at any rate. Um, the Serbs were attacking Sarajevo from their positions on Mount Igman, but there were also Bosnian troops and there was a French battalion there. And so it was, it was just kind of a dangerous place. Uh, and so you kind of had to take your chances in terms of slipping through. So the convoy waited until after dark and, uh, and that's when we, we entered, we took this really treacherous track over Mount Igman lights out. Everybody had, uh, nods, you know, night night vision goggles, except us because uh, our guys unfortunately, I don't know, they probably didn't know we were going to have to uh, rely on them to get in. in but it was a book that the uh, agency policy was that you couldn't carry a gun at the time. Right. Because I guess the agency, and I was the only guy there, but I guess because the agency lawyers didn't want to have to deal with a, you know, any kind of a mess. And, and as I point out in the book, a year later, after there were thousands of U.S. troops and dozens of agency officers serving side by side with the troops, everybody was free to carry a weapon then. <laughs> but it was probably a lot less necessary. A hell lot safer. You know that, that that didn't stop me, but you know that's that was the way the uh, the, the the lawyers looked at things. At any rate, we made it into Sarajevo, and my mission there. Oh, I know your question was about the Iranians. So uh, no, that's okay. I want to hear us too. <laughs> to hook up with this Bosnian, uh, the head of the Bosnian security service, and also uh, so I could just start collecting intelligence on what's happening and identifying targets for NATO to shoot at, essentially, in the coming month. And, um, and they were happy to help with that. I also knew that there, you know, there were a lot of Muj, Mujahideen there who had been in Afghanistan, who are now coming down to fight in Bosnia, because, you know, from their perspective and from Osama bin Laden's perspective, the West turns its back on uh, the Bosnian Muslims. And you could say that there's, there was some truth to that. But there was also, we'd heard, uh, you know, an Iranian presence, although we didn't know much about it. And uh, I would meet with the head of the Bosnian Security Service every day at the Interior Ministry and, uh, you know, driving at high speed to and from the meeting because of sniper fire. And there was not too many people in the street in those days. Um, and he was happy to share with me intelligence on Serb 
positions, you know, where where their communications were, anti-aircraft sites, ammo dump, whatever. He was 100% cooperative because he knew we could come in and, and uh, you know, blow the shit out of them, basically, and they could not. Uh, but when I asked him about, uh, you know, the Iranian presence there, he, all he would say is, Iran is welcome here. And I thought, oh, that, that's interesting. Well, one day I go to show up for my, uh, my daily meeting with him, and the receptionist tells me to meet him. Instead of going upstairs like I normally did, she said, One, meet, meet Marco over there in that little office. Okay, so I go in. Marco's in there, and he was dressed camouflage. They always were dressed in camouflage fatigues. And then there was this big, uh, you know, I thought he was an Arab, he, a big Middle Eastern-looking guy with a beard, also in camouflage fatigues, standing there uh, in this little room. And I said, you know, good day, Marco. Or, and he goes, oh, sorry, uh, it was a mistake. Uh, I'll meet you upstairs in five minutes. So I thought, okay. And I did and went about my uh, business. But it struck me as odd, you know, like it seemed like it was an intentional right. mistake, you know, and I didn't know who th this guy was. Well, later that day or night, uh, I found out from, as, you, as I told you offline, an incredibly reliable source, 100% reliable, that uh, he was that the, the the Middle Eastern looking guy was indeed the head of the Iranian intelligence service in Sarajevo, and he had tasked his uh, agent, my colleague, the head of the Bosnian security service, to bring me into this meeting so that he could see me. He showcased me essentially uh -huh. because his plan was to uh, pick me up, kidnap me and do all kinds of other nasty things to me, uh, as they had done to uh, my no, colleague William Buckley in Beirut 10 years earlier. And the reason they did this is not because I was anybody special, uh, but I, I was the guy who showed up and declared myself in true name as a CIA officer in, Bo in Iranian territory, essentially. You know, at that time, that was their backyard. That's how they looked at it. They were established there, and it would be like walking into, you know, Tehran, essentially, and saying, hey, I'm from the CIA. I'm here to help. So to them, it was a target of an opportunity, and he had a very, I got to read his, uh, it was a translation from Farsi, but I got to read his, uh, his plan for me. He described me physically, and he had uh, all the details there, and as you probably know from the Buckley case, if the Iranians get you, you are never going to leave because they, right. they're they not going to trade you. They don't want to ever show their hand. They're not going to spike the football like we did with Suleimani. You know, you're, you're going to be tortured to death eventually. Yeah, yeah. And um, and so I found that out and decided, okay, I, now what? And then came the rest of the story. Yeah, I mean, it had to send the, the hackles up when you walked into that room and there's this big bearded dude just standing there eyeballing you. I, I yeah. had to know immediately, like, something's super wrong here. Yeah, something didn't seem right. But again, that that wasn't my focus. This, I wasn't in Iraq, you know. I mean, I was in Bosnia. Right. It was a, And my concern was just not getting killed by a random sniper or right. mortar. Not that anybody was targeting me, but it was just a dangerous place to be. So your whole focus is on how you're going to stay alive and do your job in this war zone, and, and so it was weird, but it wasn't. And you're, it wasn't my focus. You you're know? not expecting this from an ally, from somebody who stands to benefit. Right. Uh, you you are the enemy of his enemy. You are his friend in this situation, and you can bring the firepower. So you have no reason to suspect that he would have any sort of, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, any sort of de uh, yeah. designs on you. Yeah, it just it didn't really. I knew it just seemed weird, but it didn't. You know, it didn't occur to me that that might be what is happening until I found out what was happening. How soon um, after that did you find? How soon after that was it when you found out what was happening? I I think it was within twenty four hours, and so so then I had to you know kind of switch my focus from being how do I survive in this crazy war zone to not getting picked up off the street by somebody who's targeting me personally. So I couldn't leave our compound from that point forward because they knew me. They knew my vehicle. Um, 
And so, and, and, you know, I figured out the Bosnians were collaborating with, with the Iranians. That was the first evidence we had that they were under their control. And as I found out a couple of years later, at that point, even the uh, Bosnian interior minister, Ali Spahic, was an Iranian asset, as was Marco, the head of the service who I was meeting with. So, yeah, they were cooperative in terms of telling me everything about Srebrenica or about where the uh, Serb targets were for us to blow up. But they were still under Iranian control. And and kind of like with ISIS, even though we and Iran were on the same side, in, in a sense, this was too big of a of a prize for the Iranians sure. to pass up. Because if they take you out and they don't and the American government doesn't know that they facilitated the Iranian involvement, they're just gonna send somebody else out with no you know, with no idea of, of what the source of their information was. Exactly. So it's it's good for a lot of people that I found out when I did. Uh, and you said that you actually got to read the plan they had for you. I mean, what was their what was their plan to kidnap you? Uh, you know, it's been a long time, but essentially picked me up off the street somewhere because I was out the street every day, mm -hmm. and so picked me up. And uh, and it was um, my recollection is it was approved by their headquarters and. And uh, again, this all happened sort of fast, and so, uh, and I, I read it one time, uh, I believe it was the, the MOIS, you know, looking back, it seems like it might, might have been Kud's force, because these are the guys who are overseas doing this kind of thing. Right. Uh, and again, I, did, I didn't spend a lot of time reading it or anything else. I mean, I just had to sort of, I read it and had to decide what to do. Uh, but it was Iranian intelligence, at the very least MOIS, and probably Quds Force, but I can't say for sure. So now you're in this position where you have to figure out how to get out of this, uh, you know, beleaguered city that's just in a constant state of warfare before these guys get their chance to kidnap or assassinate you. So, I mean, what, what, what was the plan that you came up with to get yourself out of there? Right. Well, first I spoke with, uh, you know, headquarters because, believe it or not, headquarters wasn't, uh, didn't alert me to this. It was my colleague in Zagreb who alerted me to it. I, I, I can't get into too much detail, but he was more diligent than anybody at headquarters was. So uh, thanks to him, I'm still here. But uh, so they, they came up with a few ideas, none of which were very good. Uh, we were talking to uh, UCOM and General Hayden, uh, Michael Hayden was in Stuttgart at the time, I believe, and so they talked about maybe sending in a helicopter to get me, but that would have taken several days of preparation, and, and there was no helicopters flying over Sarajevo in those days. Everybody would have taken a shot at it, mm -hmm. and so I didn't, I didn't really like any of the ideas they came up with, so uh, there was a, uh, a diplomatic security guy in, my, in our office there, and also uh, an undercover uh, JSOC guy there ostensibly diplomatic security and I talked to them and we came up with a plan we'll just sort of every now and then they would go out in the middle of the night uh, to make a run to split for example and so uh, they would just make an, an unannounced run to split the next night leave the compound at two in the morning and make a run for it over uh, over Mount Igmon again and, and again the, typically they're just concerned about also not getting shot by the Serbs by the anti-aircraft guns, by a sniper. Uh, but now we had to worry about the Iranians and their Bosnian collaborators, who we thought were our friends, uh, looking for me. And so it was uh, pretty nerve-wracking. And that was the plan we came up with. It was basically a two-vehicle convoy. Uh, and so we took off at 2 a.m. And I was obviously alert to any signs of surveillance, and there, there was none. And at this point, the, as far as I know, the the Bosnians didn't know, that, obviously, that I was planning on getting out of town. In fact, when I missed, uh, I missed one meeting with him. I, I called in sick, essentially, and then uh, so that he wouldn't, you know, but I can only do that for so long. If I'm calling sure. in sick for five days in a row, he's going to know that I know. And so uh, I had to, I had, I, I could use that excuse for a little bit, but then I had to get out. So we left the compound around 2 or 2.30 and got as far as, uh, you know, we crossed Sarajevo Airport, and there were a lot of UN checkpoints and Bosnian military and police checkpoints in those days. 
We made it to the base of Mount Igman, but we got held up there because there was incoming Bosnian army uh, traffic that had to clear the checkpoints before we could go up. We wanted to go up and over the mountain before uh, the sun came up. And uh, we were there delayed for a couple of hours and the sun was starting to come up. And so we thought about uh, heading back to the uh, compound because and trying again the next night because it's too dangerous if it's too if it's too light out. But there was a, kind of like a light haze or over the city that day, so the visibility wasn't good. And we knew the Serbs were typically drunk around you know 4:30 in the morning or, or at least hungover, not very attentive. So we decided to make a run for it, uh, all the while alert to any signs that Bosnians or the Iranians were you know going to come after us and. Keep in mind, these, these guys, the, my JSOC and uh, diplomatic security uh, friends were heavily armed and highly competent. And so my buddy and I were armed too, but I knew I was in, in good hands. And I think we had somebody else in another vehicle. But uh, we were in good hands, um, and we made it. And, and again, made it without getting shot by the Serbs as well, which was just as much. We passed by some smoldering hulks of UN vehicles that had just been shot that night, you know. And so... Uh, Made it out to uh, to split and um, and the rest is history. <laughs> we we have another super chat from Andrew, and this is uh, Andrew also. So it uh, so it was just you and Hillary Clinton dodging snipers, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, and uh, speaking of Hillary, I was before I was sent to Sarajevo, my division chief said. Hillary Clinton decided that we need to open a station in Sarajevo. And, and again, at the time, she was not Secretary of State. First she lady. was uh, First Lady. Um, and you can argue whether it was right or wrong, but that was what I was told, is that she she made the call to, to open a station. And Andrew just wants to clarify, to be clear, that it, it was just, he was just making fun of Hillary Clinton. Uh, that's it. Oh, I, uh, I got that. Yeah. <laughs> And there's a uh, there's an interesting little epilogue to this story in your book. You talk about how this entire story, uh, uh, your close call with the Iranians, got leaked to what was it, the Washington Post, for political reasons. And I wonder yeah. if you could tell us a little bit about that because that's a little bit of a it's of interest for what we read in the newspaper and why it shows up there. Right. You know. Right. So it was the L.A. Times. It was it was James Risen who at the time uh, was working with the L.A. Times, and he has excellent sources within the intelligence community and is, you know, a fantastic journalist, I think. And uh, so this was about two years, maybe a little bit less than two years after it happened, front page of the LA Times, there's this story that says, uh, Bosnia betrayed U.S. spy to Iran or something along those lines. And it told my story, it didn't identify me by, by name, but it told my story. And this was supposedly a classified story. And so I was kind of blown away and uh, eventually figured out that uh, they had they had leaked this story. Somebody, and I, don't, I still don't know who leaked it. I assume it was somebody in the CIA, but it, that it was essentially approved. They had the Dayton Accords where they're trying to bring peace to Bosnia. And one of the conditions for peace was that the, the Bosnians had to get rid of all the Iranians and others of their ilk in Bosnia. And so by by leaking the story, it made it more understandable and believable that, yeah, there are Iranians in Bosnia doing these bad things. They're a threat to America. We need to get them out. What they didn't say was something that I had stumbled across several years earlier in Croatia. Uh, I learned and at the time there was, a, you know, the, the war was raging in Bosnia. There was an arms embargo on on Bosnia and Croatia, and so it was illegal for us to for anybody to provide weapons to the Bosnians, even though they desperately needed them. And my uh, my contact in the Croatian security service, let's just say he was extremely close to the president of Croatia. He said uh, one night we were having this meeting, and uh, he said, "HK, uh, there's something I need to talk to you about." And, and, and also to set the, the stage, uh, the scene, a couple of years earlier, we had inter we worked together to intercept an Iranian relief flight in Zagreb. Relief, relief flight meaning it was mainly weapons, and even a couple of mercenaries and a couple of samovars. 
and we intercepted it and sent it back. So we are trying to, our policy was, we want to stop all weapons, especially Iranian weapons, obviously. And it's uh, a counter so the Iranian influence in that region. Yeah, just, you know, it's not a good thing. And so my Croatian government contact says, uh, your ambassador, Peter Galbraith, asked the Croatian president, Tujman, to uh, allow Iranian weapons to transit Croatia en route to Bosnia. Wow. And I said, yeah, and I said, no, I said, you you know, I think he must have, there must be some misunderstanding because, number one, it's illegal. Mm -hmm. You know, the U.S. government, we, you know, we intercept those things. And number two, it's just idiotic. Why would the U.S. government enable Iranian weapons to go to Bosnia? I'm not opposed to covert arms. You know, if you want to send in some Saudi weapons or whatever and help the Bosnians, sure, we can, you know, you might want to look at something like that. But at, the, at that moment in time, we weren't doing that. And we certainly wouldn't want Iranian weapons to go in. He said, no, that's what he said, believe it or not. And it turned out that um, it was a secret policy. It was, and, and, and also to backtrack, I'm not political. Uh, I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't, I, I criticize every president because and I look at it through CIA eyes. If they screw up intelligence or ignore it or politicize it, uh, they suck. And and I, I say that in my book about both Presidents Bush, about Obama, and about Clinton. I mean, so I'm, I'm a very apolitical, bipartisan critic of of our politicians. Uh, but uh, but anyway, the, this secret policy was known only to Clinton, National Security Advisor Anthony Lake, and Ambassador Galbraith, and the Croatian president, and my contact, and me. So now I'm thinking, and I was just there TDY for a And you only found out by mistake. You weren't supposed to know. I, I wasn't supposed to know, but, you know, this the, the president knew something didn't, the Croatian president knew this didn't sound right. And we often, the CIA often had more uh, influence and better contacts in a country than the ambassador did. Uh, they would often come to us first. I've had ambassadors come to me to help arrange meetings, believe it or not, which sounds crazy. But uh, so essentially, the president wanted to check with us to see if this was true because he knew that we'd worked together to intercept previous Iranian shipment. And I said, I'm going to have to get back to you on that. <laughs> you know, I, di I didn't know what in the hell to do at that point. And so I did not immediately report it in cable traffic. I waited for my colleague to get back. I was just essentially there uh, to cover for him for a few weeks. So he came back in the next few days or the next week. And I told him about what had happened. And it fell to him to deal with it in official channels. So essentially, CIA was a whistleblower. Um, not using the whistleblower statute and all that, but, but we blew the whistle on this illegal, ostensibly Ill illegal and idiotic activity. It came to a halt, and the ambassador was not happy with CIA, and it, it soured relations between us for a long time. And in fact, I, uh, I cite in the book a congressional investigation into the ambassador's uh, improper behavior towards the CIA after we reported his, uh, his idiotic behavior. Yeah, I, I mean, I, without knowing that the president was behind that and stuff, I would have just thought that Iran had gotten to the ambassador somehow, you know, and that he was playing proxy for them. Like, that's very unusual for the, for, for the president to, you know. But, but that it's the president, a national security adv advisor, and the ambassador, where, I mean, I mean, HK, you know better than I do that this is not how covert action programs are supposed to work. Right, that we went through this with yeah, Oliver right. North. Oh, exactly. Yeah, you don't use the ambassador for covert action. And, and I don't know whose idea it was to do this. I don't know if it was the ambassador's idea and he pushed it up the chain of command or if it was Anthony Lakes. And, and again, the, you, you could say their motives were good. They want to help the Bosnians. Okay, great. Let's figure out a way to help There's the Bosnians. There's another way to do that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you don't invite the Iranians into the heart of Europe. You know, unbelievable. Do you think part of the reason why maybe they did this, why they pursued it in this manner, was because there were congressional limitations on what we could do in Bosnia at the time, so they had to get quote-unquote creative? Uh, you know, 
Well, like, 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 I mean, like Oliver North, like, let's use Iran to do things yeah. since we can't. Yeah, absolutely. Because, again, we had this arms embargo. And, and again, I was not there to support. I was just there to represent the U.S. government and to collect intelligence. And uh, my, I'm sure my book will piss off Serbs. It's going to piss off Croats, <laughs> Bosnians, Albanians. It means I'm doing my job. You know, I, I'm not biased in favor of one or the other. Uh, I say good and bad about each, I sort of call it as I see it, but you could argue that our arms embargo really did hurt the Bosnian Muslims, it hurt the Croats, uh, you know, it only helped the Serbs who we eventually decided were the bad guys, so why do we have this arms embargo? So that absolutely could have been one of the motivations, <laughs> some way get around this arms embargo, but still, that's not how you go about it. Right, right. Do you, it, uh, it's uh, It has shades of Syria and yeah. the mess we made over there. Yeah. Do you, and I mean, I think a lot of times that's because, like, the policymakers get such, they don't understand, they don't research stuff, you know, they have a staffer who has a bare under, the barest understanding and their own motivations or whatever, who briefs them on it, yeah, this is the side we should be on, or this is what we should do, and, and that's what they do, they don't, they don't know, I mean, probably most of the politicians involved had no idea where, where, you know, Bosnia Herzegovina was where you know they, they had no idea what's going on. They're like, okay, yeah, just stop weapons to everybody. They they can't fight if they don't have weapons. Uh, right, you know. and that's and that was a good sentiment. But again, but these were pretty sophisticated people. This is Peter Galbraith, a very sharp guy, a respected ambassador. Uh, you know, Anthony Lake. He got in trouble for this, and I heard that he was up to be CIA director after this, but. One of the reasons he was not uh, put into that position was because of this Iran arms fiasco. So, you know, these were pretty sharp people involved. So it's I still don't understand whose idea it was and why they thought it was a good yeah. idea. Guys, we're uh, one hour in. I just want to take another opportunity to plug HK's book. This is what we're talking about today, American Spy. If you're just joining us, HK is a retired CIA operations officer had a lot of experience in the Balkans and other parts of the world, which is what we're talking about here today. And he, he wrote a lot of these stories. I mean, it's also, we're talking today uh, about a lot of kind of dark things, but this is actually a really funny book. And there's a lot of funny anecdotes in here about HK's adventures around the world. Uh, you know, your wife and your kids are part of the story. They're, they're along for the ride. Um, so it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and I also want to take a second to remind everyone who's watching, you know, Please subscribe to the stream if you haven't already. Um, yeah, subscribe have? to the stream. I uh, hit the button for notifications. Um, join our subreddit, which is uh, Reddit. The slash, link is in the description. Yeah, the, uh, the team house. Um, and please uh, buy HK's book and check it out. It, uh, you know, phenomenal read. Um, and also, our rent just went up. <laughs> so. Uh. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, so we're turning to you guys. If you enjoy our content, uh, if you enjoy us having guests like HK on, uh, please uh, join us on Patreon. Uh, the link is is below, and even a dollar a month. We have two, almost two thousand subscribers now. Two thousand. Uh, one dollar a day from or one dollar a day. One dollar a month from each subscriber would uh, have us in in the green. Um, did did uh, what happened to you in Bosnia? How did that? Obviously, they didn't, they didn't send out another case officer, did they? I mean, how did that affect our relations with, with Bosnia at that time, with our policy and support of them? You know, Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I don't really know the answer to that because once I was out, you know, I no longer have a need to know what's going on there. And so I was sort of shut out of what was happening there. So they, they obviously knew what was... Uh, what was going on so they dealt with it you know however they dealt with it and I'm not saying there's a connection but both the Iranian uh, who targeted me and my Bosnian counterpart who showcased me to him died under bloody and mysterious circumstances inside Bosnia and I honestly don't know how that happened uh, uh, how, uh, how far from this event did they die I'm guessing within my recollection is like within a year or so. Wow. And I don't think it had anything to do with, I'd like to think that it did, but this was pre nine 11. So we, you know, we yeah. didn't fully take the gloves off until nine 11. And so I doubt it had anything to do with us. Now what happened shortly after I got out, cause I got out in July 
I think in August is when NATO started bombing Serb targets, including those that I identified when I was, you know, from Sarajevo. And so that was the first uh, uh, thing that happened. You know, whether we had a, a new chief there or not, I just don't know. That, you know, I wouldn't have been told. But I know that's when NATO finally got involved and, uh, you know, and that eventually led to the, to the peace accord. And the, the other thing I wanted to ask you about that really blew my mind reading this book is that you recreated, because you couldn't publish actual cable traffic, it's still classified, locked up in a vault somewhere. Um, so you just kind of recreated cable traffic uh, in a semi-fictional manner, I guess, and, and put it into the book so people could get an idea of how it works. But you, well, I mean, is it true that you sent up the initial cable traffic back to DC on the Srebrenica massacre? Yeah, so I was there when Srebrenica fell, just coincidentally, you know, that's, I didn't know it was going to happen, but I just happened to be there. Srebrenica and then another so-called safe haven called Jepa, uh, they both fell while I was there. And so uh, I didn't go to Srebrenica. I was in Sarajevo and I was getting most of my intelligence from the Bosnian security service, which had its own sources in Srebrenica. And so they provided me with the intelligence and, uh, yeah, I remember Madeleine Albright was, I think she was the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations at the time. And she was, she knew I was there and I was getting requirements directly from her, from the White House. It was pretty cool. You know, this is kind of what you live for if you're a CIA officer is to have your reporting actually paid attention to by somebody in Washington mm -hmm. um, and not just by an, an analyst and then, it, you know, disappears somewhere. So that, I love that aspect of it, knowing that everything I reported, it was being sent raw to the White House, to the Pentagon, to... Uh, you know the NSC, and so she wanted to know how many, you know, she, how many people were were killed in Srebrenica, and I said based on my sources there, between six and eight thousand in the first couple of days were killed, and and nobody really believed it initially. It was just too much to to imagine. How could they do this? You know, this is Europe after all. We had safe havens, and you know, but they did, and it turned out that that number was uh, was spot on, if not if not low. Can you lay out what your sources told you, what you learned about the Srebrenica, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it, uh, th this massacre? Because, I mean, I think it's really important for people to understand that this was a, a genocide that was taking place in Europe in the 1990s. I mean, there were death yeah. camps in Europe in the 1990s. Like, that's insane to really think about. Yeah. And now, at the time, I mean, we knew that there were atrocities, even when I was in Croatia, We'd set up this refugee debriefing center to, uh, to debrief refugees coming out of Croatia and Bosnia uh, for use to, you know, as evidence in war crimes, future war crimes uh, tribunals. Um, at the time, though, I wasn't really focused on the nitty gritty of, of the atrocities. You know, it was more big picture stuff like the Serbs are opening up this corridor to make their way to Sarajevo. They slaughtered between six and eight thousand here. You know, they do have the rape camps and the concentration camps but it wasn't in the in the fictitious cable in in my book i get into a lot of the nitty-gritty and those are all uh true stories as far as i know <clears throat> but a lot of those weren't reported until long after uh or at least long after i was there and so i i pulled those together from a lot of open sources and put them into the cable just just to, number one, to share the truth about what happened in Srebrenica, because a lot of people don't remember or know or care, but also that's the type of thing that would go into a cable, typically. Um, but my my reporting was more big picture stuff, mm -hmm. even though we knew about what was happening, you know, it was more big picture reporting. And, and is it true what you wrote in there then, that the, the response you got back from your employer was, you know, what the fuck are you doing disguising yourself as a journalist and uh, invoicing us for a gasoline? Like, what the hell is wrong with you? That, that kind of thing happened over the course of my career. You know, that's why it's almost surreal. You're, you're reporting on a war massacre. crimes, trying to stay alive, and they're, you know, t telling you you're going to, you know, if, if you, if you, are caught with a weapon, you're going to have a reprimand in your personnel file and you may lose your job or we can't reimburse you for the black market gasoline you bought because you don't have a receipt. Right. I mean, all this stuff just kind of going on at the same time. 
and that's all sort of to be expected. But what's what's frustrating uh, is if they don't believe your intelligence or if they downplay it or don't disseminate it because they're relying instead on Serb radio out of Pale or open source State Department reporting. You know, come on, this is this is what the CIA does. This is why you pay us to go there and collect the secret stuff, you know, the stuff that's not openly available. And there's not much that's not openly available anymore. But, uh, you know, that's the really frustrating part is if they uh, <coughs> ignore or politicize your intelligence. So what, So when you say that uh, Srebrenica was, uh, was a safe haven, what, what does that mean exactly? Were there, were there allied, uh, allied NATO or, or were, were there forces there that were meant to protect? Yeah, if, if you could, for the sake of the audience, yeah. explain, you know, what that event was and, yeah. and how that went down. Right. So the United Nations peacekeepers were there in Bosnia at the time. In fact, that's, it was their convoy who we drove in with to Sarajevo. Remember, they were bringing relief supplies in multiple nationalities, you know, people from Denmark and you know, I mean, all over the world, typical UN contingent. They were armed, but they, they didn't really have uh, either the permission or the, uh, um, or the ability to, to fight off the Serbs. So yes, the, the UN was in Srebrenica, they were in Jepa, they declared it a safe haven. And then uh, Ratko Mladic, who was the, the Bosnian Serb general, one of the top two war criminals, along with Radovan Karadzic, who was the political leader, he basically, uh, you know, told the UN peacekeepers to stand aside. He was going to take over Srebrenica. And I think NATO bombed one Serb tank or something. And after that, Vladic took a bunch of UN peacekeepers hostage. A French general negotiated with them and said, we'll pull out, just let our hostages go. French general Morion, I think is who it was. And then the Dutch peacekeepers also got a lot of flack for abandoning Srebrenica to the Serb slaughter. But the fact is, you know, like I said, they didn't really have the ability or the authority to, to do much about it. If the Serbs wanted to take over Srebrenica, they were going to do it whether the UN was there or not. So the idea of a safe haven was more in theory than in, than in practice. Yeah, when they're, they're under, as peacekeepers, their rules of engagement are... are strict i mean and very very tight they, and even even so they don't they they don't have a huge supply you know logistics train to to support any kind of ex, ex, extended conflict they probably got the magazines they're carrying and that's it yeah exactly they just weren't equipped and they and the rules of engagement wouldn't have allowed it i don't i don't believe you know i think of it like baghdad today where if you know, if the Shiite militias decided to overrun our massive embassy compound, they probably could, you know, if, he, if, they, if they've decided to activate enough enough people. It was kind of like that in Srebrenica. There, you know, we were counting on the goodwill of the Bosnian Serbs, and there was basically none at the time. They were going right. to do what they were going to do. Right. And they did, so the UN hightailed it out of there. There's another interesting thing you point out in your book uh, about working in this part of the world. And uh, I just want to briefly tell you a, a story of my own, my own story uh, being in Belgrade a couple of years ago that I think like kind of leads right into it because I understood exactly what you're talking about, um, that I was there what, in 2017 to do a television show for the Discovery Channel. And one of the people I was meeting with was a... Uh, he was um, a, a college professor, and he was also the leader or a leader in the Serbian Socialist Party. So my thoughts are, this is a serious guy. I got to have my game face on, got to have it together, right? Um, we meet him at uh, the castle in Belgrade. That's right along the river. Uh, I was told that it's changed hands like 40-something times throughout history. Uh, we meet this guy there and start having this very... Um, basic conversation about Serbian history. And then whenever the, the Discovery Channel people turn the cameras off and we're kind of talking off the cuff, this guy like immediately launches into the story and starts telling us, he's like, you know, you know, the, the, the gypsy girls, when they turn 16, they, they get naked and they have a party and, and, and they touch each other. And like he's smoking a cigarette. And he's like, I, I, I think they kiss. And I'm like, were you saying like, a, like an orgy? 
You're like, I, I don't know. I don't know if they have sex, but they kiss each other. The, the gypsy girls, they get naked. It's a ritual they do. And then he goes right into talking about like pornography and like, you know, today with the blue pill, you don't know who the real stallion is anymore. Like getting all fired up about this. And this is like, I thought this was a serious guy. He's a college professor and a politician in Serbia. I'm like, this is a fucking clown show. Like who, who, who sent this guy here? Right. What the hell is going on? So when you wrote in your book, HK, that it's like impossible to get to the truth because in this part of the world, because there's just conspiracy theories within conspiracy theories. And these people are, they're just like raised from the day they come out of the womb to believe in these like Byzantine conspiracy theories floating around. And, and I, I mean, largely, I guess it's because of the history of the region. And like I said, the Belgrade had changed hands like 40 years and all the ethnic tension. But anyway, um, that's just my own little anecdote with that. Uh, I was just wondering if you could share some of those experiences with us. Yeah, you definitely got a good taste with the Balkans with that with that experience. But, but yeah, there, you know, everybody I dealt with was very nice to me, you know, whether they're Bosnians or Serbs or Croats, yeah, yeah. you know, I, w I was an outsider and they were for the most part, very nice. And also very intelligent and very, and highly educated for the most part, the people who I dealt with. But they were all brought up. It's like tribalism on steroids. And so, you know, you can be talking with the most educated. And again, I haven't been there in a long time, so maybe things have changed a bit, although I kind of doubt it. Um, just to use an example, the most educated, open-minded Serb on earth. And, but you get to a certain point, and they say, but, you know, Albanians are dogs, and they should all be killed. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> okay. Because they've all been brainwashed in their tribe's culture and the stories from the time they're born. And they're sort of taught all these things. And some of the things they're taught are probably true. But other things, you know, like Serbs would literally, they would tear up when talking about the Battle of Kosovo of 1389, which they lost. 1389. And use that as justification for what they're doing in Kosovo at that time, you know, today, let's say. And so it, you can't, you just can't really reason with them about certain things. You know? Right. Especially, you know, it, I would find out very quickly. I mean, in this case, it was a younger kid. He was probably 18 years old. Finds out I'm an American. Like, clears his throat. <clears throat> Let me explain to you why today's borders around Serbia are inappropriate. Okay, sit down. We're going to talk about greater Serbia now and have a little classroom time on this. And I mean, yeah, like you said, it's just, it's in their DNA. Yeah, it, it is. And all of them are, and the Bosnians are like that, the Croats are like that, and they all have their conspiracy theories. And it just, I mean, and, and they would have state controlled TV. And it was, you know, Serbs are kind of like Russians' cousins, you know, it's the same alphabet. And they sort of think the same way. And I see stuff that Putin does and says, and the things I have that a Russian coffee are, mug that know. I bought in Belgrade. What's that? I have a, uh, it's a coffee mug with Putin's face on it that I bought at like a stall in Belgrade in the park. <laughs> There's a lot of similarities mob. between the Russians and the Serbs, and, and they're historically allies, and the Russians always tend to favor the Serbs. Um, but I have one story, just to give you an idea of the conspiracy theories that people will believe. When I was in Croatia early on in the war, uh, the Yugoslav Air Force flew over Zagreb, bombed the presidential palace, didn't kill anybody, I don't think, and flew off. The, the Serbs said, uh, or the Yugoslavs at the time said, no, we didn't. Yes, we were flying by innocently overhead. Well, what happened was the Croats knew we were going to fly over, and so they planted a bomb inside the presidential <laughs> palace, and they waited for us to fly over and activated it as we did so to look like we did it. And people bought it. Uh -huh. And that's just every day of the week there's something like that uh, coming out, and people yeah. believe it. How, what does that mean for your job as an intelligence officer working in that part of the of the world where you're very much in the business of discerning what the truth is and getting objective information back to our policymakers in America? Right. It, it, that made it really tough. And uh, that's why it's so important to have good quality people as your sources, your assets, because you you know ninety percent of it's bullshit. And you have and you hear the same things over and over. They all want to educate you on how things really are, whether in Kosovo or Serbia or Croatia, and uh, even in language school in D.C. Beforehand, those of us going to Belgrade were taught Serbian. Those going to Zagreb were taught Croatian. They're very similar languages, but slightly different. 
And we were taught by native Croats, native Serbs, and half of language training was them trying to brainwash their students into the so Serbian way yeah. of life or the Croatian way of life. And so we learned early on to, you know, to sort of block out most of what they said. But it, it was it was a challenge, and that's why having documents uh, delivered were were good because that was the real deal. This was a professional intelligence service, and they don't get messed up in or mixed up in you know the conspiracy theories. This is their own internal documentation, yeah. so that was good. Plus, my asset was uh, sort of a true Yugoslav. He he was really able to separate. Uh, tribalism from fact and analysis. He was a true pro, and we were really lucky to have uh, access to him and his his insights. Can, can you say where that gentleman is today? I mean, is he okay? I don't know. I, again, once I left, I had no need to know what happened, other than I wanted to make sure my predis my successor took care of him as you know as well as I did. Uh, but after that, I uh, I don't sure. know. It, it's interesting. Because it seems that the more tribalistic a, a community or a country or a collection of, you know, whatever you want to call them, is the more prone to conspiracy and superstition they tend to be. Because, like, if you compare Iraq to Afghanistan, two places where I spent a lot of time, Iraq does have some of the conspiracy and, and superstition and things like that going on. But nowhere near as, as much as compared to particularly the tribal areas, you know, in, in the south and the east of, of Afghanistan, mm -hmm. where conspiracy and superstition were just, I mean, ve very, very common, you know. Interesting, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and, and getting through, like you say, getting through the truth uh, beyond the conspiracy, cause, because they're not, they're not hypothesizing conspiracy. They, they know it to their core. <laughs> like, you know, they, they... It's not a well, you know. Maybe it's like no. This this is the truth. This is you know. It had to have been them, or this yeah. is how it is. So, um, did it take you a while to learn, like, to wade through that when you first went out there? Because it's something that's very foreign to a Western mind. It is. Now, luckily, I had nine months or so of language school which was a good orientation, not only into the language, but into the culture and how they think. And so, you know, I kind of, I kind of knew what I was getting into. Yeah. Uh, and I can't really get into what I was doing in my day job, but I spent a lot of time with the people speaking the language every single day and a lot of contact with people. And so I really got to know uh, everything about, I could, I could sort of blend in. I could, you know, tell the jokes and curse and, yeah. everything else with like with the best of them and so i really got to understand the place really well uh and so that made it a lot a lot better as well and i think to be a good cia officer you have to really enjoy getting into a culture and a language and all if yeah. you know if you don't love doing that you know you're not going to be very effective i think I was wondering if you'd be willing to talk to us a little bit then about uh, after you left the CIA, you went into the private sector and returning back to the Balkans and getting involved in the hunt for some of these war criminals. And you had some pretty interesting stories in the book about that as well. Yeah, so I left. Uh, actually, so I didn't retire. I resigned from the CIA uh, sort of mid-career for a variety of reasons. And I started my own uh company, I, I, I continued to operate like a station. I continued to run sources overseas, collect intelligence, but my customers or clients were no longer the U.S. government for the most part. It was corporate clients. So, for example, I would have a, a big bank or a tobacco company who wanted an investigation done in Kosovo or, or somewhere in Central Europe. And so I continued to do the same job, but for uh, but for you know private custom, private uh, clients, I also continued to work uh, as needed for the CIA, uh, and I get into some of those stories in the book as well. But the war criminal thing came about because uh, just before 9/11, I had started work on a novel. I wanted to try my hand at fiction, and it was essentially based on Chapter One, the Sarajevo story, the Iranian uh, terrorism threat, and Bosnian war criminals, and in the novel. And I did, which I didn't finish, it was just a synopsis, uh, the former CIA guy uh, decides to go back uh, to try and track down one of the war criminals for the reward money 
for a variety of personal motives, which are in the in the novel, not necessarily in real life. Uh, and so uh, there really was a five million dollar reward at the time for for Karadzic and also for for Mladic. Those were the top two guys. And so uh, I was like nine chapters in, and then 9/11 happened. So I said, well, you know, screw the novel. Who cares about Bosnian war criminals when we got the likes of Al Qaeda? 9/11. You know, the world has changed. So I set aside the novel. Uh, but I started thinking about it. Well, why not do what the the protagonist of the novel was going to do? Why not go after the five million in reward money? Uh, what you had to do to collect it was provide intelligence that led to the capture or killing of one of these war criminals. I figured, well, hell, I could do that. <laughs> what, yeah. what could go wrong? And so I uh, I had a sort of a principal agent who I had recruited after I left the CIA. He had nothing to do with CIA in the former Yugoslavia. He had incredible sources, police, but also organized crime sources throughout the former Yugoslavia in Kosovo, Bosnia, Croatia, Serbia, you name it, great sources. He had his own stable of assets, essentially, and I was able to tap into that. So I discussed it with him. I said, what do you think about going after one of these uh, <clears throat> these war criminals for the reward money? And uh, these guys, the war criminals, were basically the same guys who were organized uh, crime figures. There was a guy named Arkan who was who was a notorious war criminal, but also involved in organized crime. And so the Serbs have an expression, "isto uh, stranje drugo pakovani," which means same shit, different packaging. And that sort of applied to the the Serb war criminal slash organized crime uh, figures. The Croats had their own expression, which was "isti uh, drek druga frizura," same shit, different hairdo. But that's how you would <laughs> describe these these guys. So. My principal agent in the Balkans and said, "Yeah, you know, I, I can, I can do this." So we came up with a plan, and his his half of the plan was to gain access to. Uh, we decided on on Karadzic, uh, because he was able to get access to him and not to Mladic. Uh, Karadzic was the political leader behind uh, the whole the Bosnian war, and so there were like. Uh, three guys in the chain between him and the source inside Karadzic's inner circle. And at the time, Karadzic was moving around almost every day to a new location. He knew he was hunted. And uh, on our intelligence was like a day old as well. And so uh, his job was to provide that intelligence. My job was to coordinate with the U.S. It was much harder. We had to coordinate with the U.S. government <laughs> and, uh, and with uh, NATO forces in Bosnia to convince them that we could come up with the uh, the intelligence that they needed because they were actively looking for these guys. And so their first uh, their first reaction was understandable. They said, we need to know who your sources are. Uh, you know, and I was on the outside at this point. I, so if I had been on the inside, I could have better influenced the bureaucracy and maybe gotten things done more my way. My way was you got to trust me to do this my way, and we will give you the green light when he's when he's down for a couple of days. We heard that he was going to have some sort of leg surgery. He'd have to be down for two or three days, and uh, we wanted. I was going to remain in constant contact with my government sources who were in or contacts who were in touch with the military, and they said no. We have to know, or we won't. We won't proceed. And and the reason they did that was because they had been on the receiving end of some bad intelligence in the past. So I don't blame them for taking that approach, but I knew that if I went that route, it wouldn't, it probably wouldn't work, but I had no choice. So we said, all yeah. right, we identified the sources. They believed us, they knew it was the real deal. Uh, but I again said, please just hold off. Don't jump the gun. Number one, don't go to my sources. Number two, don't jump the gun. Because you know they tended to move loudly and slowly yeah. So I said, wait until we give you the green light, and then you can move in. So we had everything teed up. Uh, I was in 24-7 communication with my contact in you know, the government. He was in 24-7 contact with his sources. And and then we got word there was a, uh, I think it was, what were they called? Not K4. It was like whatever the Bosnian force was at the time. They held a news conference to announce that they had tried to capture Karadzic, and they missed him, 
they caught a couple of other guys. And it was based on intelligence they had, and they mentioned the leg bit that I had provided. That, all that was only known to people in his inner circle. So they jumped the gun, they blew it, and they revealed some of the intelligence. Right. I heard Kar Karadzic immediately went on a mole hunt within his circle. Uh, luckily, he never figured out who our guy was. He had a big enough circle, and and plus our guy didn't know that I even existed. He just he was dealing with his primary contact, and there were two more between him and me. So even if he'd been under suspicion and tortured, he had no idea that this was for uh, you know the U.S. government. But at any rate, um, they blew it, and then I heard after that they actually went to our couple of our sources to try and recruit them unilaterally and these guys went to my guy who handled them and said you know we will never work for you again because you you botched it and we didn't we were each going to get a million bucks <laughs> you yeah. know there were five of us in the chain and so uh it was just a complete uh you know well, you, foobar situation you knew that the government i mean you knew the government would try and recruit your sources directly once once you turned them yeah. up. i mean once you gave them the names like that's, yeah so I, know, some, I, I, so I either had to pull the plug and just say forget it or just yeah. hope for the best, even though yeah. I knew that it probably wouldn't work out. And so we came close. Yeah. And he was luckily he was captured many years later in Belgrade, uh, posing as a uh, spiritual healer. And I have a photo of him in the book. <laughs> That's funny. You mentioned uh, in, in the book also that a lot of this sounds suspiciously like a few films that have been made. I mean, there's one where there are those journalists yeah. who are sitting around the bar drinking and they're like, hey, the UN's not doing anything to catch these war criminals. Let's go try it ourselves. Yeah. So I never finished the book, but I finished the synopsis and the synopsis tells the entire story. And I was uh, living in Los Angeles at the time and had shared uh, the, the synopsis with some agents, but also with uh, a couple of people in the entertainment industry. Anyway, like I said, 9-11 happened. I forgot about it. Figured, who cares? And a couple of years ago, I was watching this movie on Netflix. I don't even remember the name of it. It's in the book. It's a Richard Gere movie. Uh -huh. and, I, and I swear to God, and in the book, I list, like in a footnote, like a dozen side-by-side -side comparisons of my synopsis to the movie. And, I, and it was, the movie was based on an Esquire magazine article, which I remember reading a long time ago. Fantastic article. But the movie bore more resemblance to my novel synopsis than it did to the Esquire magazine article. It may be a coincidence. I don't, you know, who knows? Uh, but but the the coincidences are pretty remarkable when you when you take a look at them in the in the book. Yeah, I wrote a, a novel years ago, and uh, it was about there's a, a conspiracy in the background. It's down in Mexico, and the idea is that the CIA is going to unite all the cartels in Mexico within the Sinaloa cartel. So they will become the predominant one and it will cut down on the violence. You'll just have one mega corporate cartel, right? And then I saw the movie Sicario come out where it's like the exact same basic plot line that they're trying to unite them into, into one. And, and, you know, maybe it is just a coincidence, like you say, HK, but it's like if you squint hard enough at the movie screen, you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, Hollywood's a den of thieves, apparently. And so <laughs> once, once, you, once you share an idea, it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's up for grabs. Uh, we got a couple more super chats. Alex, thanks, Alex. Um, so he wants to know, other than uh, surveillance detection, uh, what was the favorite your favorite skill that you learned at the CIA? I talk a lot about this in the book. Um, we, I was never in the military, and a lot of us who joined were not. Some, some had military backgrounds, but a lot of us did not. And so we went through... Uh, what was called SOTSI, uh, Special Operations Training Course. It was essentially a couple of months, three months of paramilitary training at the farm. Um, and it was, it was, a lot of it was sort of, um, you know, I call it, it's like ISIS training, but without the, uh, the decapitation in Facebook, you know, it was a lot of counterinsurgency from the point of view of the, of the insurgent, you know. And so we got to learn all kinds of, uh, we got to play with all kinds of weapons. We went to demolitions training for two weeks. I learned how to make IEDs and blow things up. And it wasn't so that we would become special operations soldiers. We weren't. This was more for familiarization with the weapons and with the tactics and with uh, all these concepts so that when we are overseas, we sort of know what we're reporting on. 
but then we also got to go to jump school for two weeks, which was taught, and all this was taught primarily by former agency uh, or army agency guys who had served in Vietnam. This was because this training was in the 80s. So a lot of them came out of Vietnam and they had worked for the CIA and or the army in, in, in Vietnam. And so uh, the training from jump school, we went through SEER training, uh, which was not fun, but it was fantastic, led by the late, great Colonel Nick Rowe, if you know who he oh, is, he yeah. wrote, uh, Five Years of Freedom, and he came up with the SEER program. Yeah. But, but uh, it, so that was the most fun, was this paramilitary training, you know. <laughs> As a kid, I like to blow shit up and buy, buy explosives, and and so this was like you know it was it was great fun after being in law school for three years. Now, is that something that in the eighties all case officers were going to, or only if you were going to like a high threat area would you go through that? When I joined, this was, everybody went through it. Now, keep in mind, Reagan was president, William Casey was the CIA director. There was renewed enthusiasm and morale was high. And it was a good time to join uh, the CIA. And so, you know, I don't know how it, what happened after I went through training, but uh, it was really fantastic at the time. And uh, so we went to the, this paramilitary training first. It was also good for, obviously, team building and confidence building and all that. Uh, and then we got to know each other really well before we went to the ops course, the, the spy school, at the, also at the farm, uh, a couple of months later. So you actually had the opportunity to meet Nick Rowe before he uh, before he was killed. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I went and um, visited the traffic circle in Manila where he where he, he, where he taken out by a Sparrow team. Yeah, did you? I don't know if you read this or remember in the book. I I didn't get into it in too much detail, but I have a friend who uh, uh, was in the uh, embassy with Nick Rowe when it happened and. Uh, he went to the traffic circle and they checked out the vehicle and uh, he and others in the U.S. military uh, are convinced it was not the uh, the Philippine, what is the new people's the, army, what the army was it called? It, it was actually, uh, but judging by the way that the, that the, the shot pattern in the, in the vehicle, the professionalism of it all, the way they cased him, followed him. Uh, the tight patterns, they're 100% convinced it was the Philippine military behind it. Somebody who, apparently Nick Rowe was investigating corruption involved. You know, there was a lot of milita U.S. military uh, assistance to the Philippines, and there was a, a lot of corruption. Philippines military was involved, and he was, this is, a, this is the theory in the story anyway. I, don't, I can't say that it's, uh, that it's true, but that Nick Rowe was on to that. And he was uh, going to report what these uh, corrupt Philippines military leaders were doing, and that is why he was uh, assassinated. And that that is who did it, judging by the professionalism of, of the, the job. For any of you who haven't read it, it's a great it's a great book. Uh, it's called Five Years to Freedom uh, by Nick Rowe, who was a POW uh, in Vietnam for for five years, and it talks about his experiences, and uh, it's it's a phenomenal. And when he came back, as, as HK points out, he was the one who really pushed to create a SEER school yeah. so that American soldiers, POWs, were prepared for that experience. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, generations of us, including me, have benefited from that. Yeah, yeah, he's kind of, he's, fa yeah, the father of SEER. Um, uh, Andrew uh, said, uh, Super Chat, uh, he said, I believe it was uh, General Darme Bernard John Hanvier, or Hanvier, Janvier. Who was the uh, the lead out there during the uh, the massacre that yeah. we were talking about? The Nate. Yeah, that sounds right. I, I forget who Morion. Maybe Morion was in a different place, but yeah, that that name sounds right. And again, uh, the Dutch took a lot of the blame as well. Yeah, and so and Andrew also wants to know. Uh, he says, "Hold up, Jack suggesting he knows who the real stallion is." <laughs> no, I don't. That, that's a mystery. Uh, you have to go talk to that Serb professor <laughs> and, and tell you the truth about the Roma teenage girls and whatever the fuck that's all about. And Alex wants to know, what's everyone's thoughts on the Iowa cluster? <laughs> I'd rather HK, talk about do you have any thoughts on that, <laughs> HK? Iowa? 
Yeah, on, on the whole, on the, um, uh, I don't know if you follow the news, but on their whole caucus and or the, the, uh, the whole debacle up there about have to recount, uh, like, they're during uh, the whole, yeah. the, the involvement in the app. Are you following any of that? Do you care? Uh, a little bit, and I don't care that much. I, I just sort of despise all politicians, and uh, I probably better should better uh, keep my mouth shut when it comes to politics, because it'll, it'll only piss off half of your viewers. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jack, do you have any thoughts on it? Um, I mean, I always have thoughts. I mean, I, I always say the, the alternative name of this uh, live stream is two white dudes have thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> two old white dudes have thoughts. Oh, by the way, I turned 50 this week. Congratulations. Yeah. Mr. Dave, I yeah. saw that. Yeah. So I'm, I, I didn't realize it, but AARP managed to get like their membership info to me right on the day of my birthday. I didn't know it was 50. Yeah. I thought it would be like 55 or 60, but social security right around that corner. Man, now. I can't wait. Mm, all those yeah. fat, sweet social security benefits. Well, I, I mean, I um, I, I posted some of my thoughts on uh, on Twitter about it, and it came under attack by the uh, anonymous woke mill veteran world. Uh, it's pretty entertaining. About me turning fifty? No, about my my uh, <laughs> un insufficiently woke comments about the uh, Iowa situation. Oh, about the Iowa situation? And, and well, no, I'm sorry, not, it wasn't about Iowa. It was about um, about impeachment. Oh, and I was just saying, this is like this is a stage show. This is this is a soap opera. It's a theater, and and you know the Democrats blew it. Yeah, and now we're gonna have to deal with eight years of this idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I got an earful about that. that. That wasn't the right thing to say. What did they disagree with? That, uh, that he was an idiot that we'd have to do eight years with him? That the Democrats blew it? No, it no they, they were mad at me for saying it, it was a scandal because you're not supposed to say it's a scandal because it was real criminal activity, Jack, and gosh, gosh darn it, you know, there are constitutional issues here at play and, you know, you're a boomer having these, you know, Pat Roberts uh, takes on things, then you, sh you should just go away, delete your Twitter account. But hey, man, that's the world we live in. That's, uh, that's just yeah. how it is, so... Well, as you say, HK, I mean, you're going to alienate one half of the audience or the other, so yeah. it is what it is. Yeah. It is what it is, yeah. The only thing I will say in that regard without getting political is that I have witnessed the effects of tribalism uh, firsthand, and the results are not good. It leads to the destruction uh, of a country. Yeah. And so, for and what it's we, worth. We in this country are getting more and more tribalistic like every day. And, and, and the thing is, is it, I mean, uh, maybe we just know more about what everybody thinks because of things like Twitter and stuff. Maybe like uh, uh, previous generations have been just as divided and divisive. I don't know, but, uh, but it, it doesn't feel like we we've always been this way. And and it's almost as if now people are like forcing you to pick one side. Yeah, yeah. You have to pick a team. Like you have to pick a team. Like you can't just go, well, I don't really know. Like it's complicated. There are that, a lot of That must facts. be especially challenging, I would think, for our professionals in the intelligence community who, you know, and I've talked to people in the FBI as well, who they're like, we have to be objective. You know, we, we cannot be political partisans. I mean, do you, what, do you hear anything in that regard, HK, from your friends at the agency that it's getting more and more difficult to be a, a nonpartisan um, service member, for lack of a better term? Yeah, I think it is. And again, that's a good point that you made. You know, CIA people, FBI, military, they are traditionally very apolitical. I mean, everybody has their own personal beliefs, but I swear we never talked about politics uh, when I was in the CIA. I couldn't tell you if my friends were Democrat or Republican. We really didn't talk about it. Um, it. It didn't come up. And now I just, you know, I read that Gina Haspel, the CIA director, was not only at the, the State of the Union, which was a first because I think she's yeah. a member of the cabinet and they weren't before, but, but that she was applauding. You know, that, that, is not, that is not set a good example. I don't care if it's a Democrat or Republican. We have to remain apolitical to do the job right. Now, right. If, the, if the politicians want to politicize the intelligence and screw things up, that's their prerogative, you know. But the but the professional, you know, the working people have to stay out of politics. And I think it is getting harder and harder to do that. There is so much pressure, as you say, to pick a side. 
And that's how it was in Yugoslavia. You pick a side, and uh, and it leads to the destruction of the of the country. Yeah, yeah. I, and the thing is, is it, once you pick a side, just because of confirmation bias and everything else, you you lose all objectivity. It, you you it, your brain can. I mean, your brain just cannot re remain objective at that point because you're rooting for a sports team. Yeah. You know, and yeah. it's not like, oh, I'm going to choose to believe this or choose not to believe this. Like, your brain has pathways that are being formed that, that are going to jump logical processes. And you're going to reach, you're going to form, a, you know, a, a conclusion based on whatever, you know, whatever your beliefs are. And then your, build will, your brain will build the logical system be, to support that. And yeah. then you're lost, you know, you're, yeah. you're lost. Yeah. HK, could we uh, talk a little bit then about your second business endeavor in the private sector where, I mean, you basically, I mean, you did, you drove into Iraq right after the invasion. I uh, kind of just trying to spearhead this entrepreneurial <laughs> endeavor in Iraq. And I mean, you sent me that picture of you in the middle of the sandstorm that you, I mean, it just sounded like completely insane to me that you were doing this. Uh, without U.S. government auspices just going off on your own, hoping to start something, and, you know, maybe the government would nibble on it, you know, later on if, if it was successful. Yeah, well, first of all, the photo was actually of my colleague who was an American who was with me when we went in uh, during the sandstorm. And, if, you know, you've probably been in some of these sandstorms where uh, it turns day into night, yeah. literally. And, yeah. and it's it's an eerie, eerie, scary feeling because you don't know who's going to run into you or... Uh, or, or what's going to happen. But yeah, so when I, uh, I'll, I'll briefly tell you how I got into Iraq. You know, it seemed like a good idea at the time. I had, uh, after I left the CIA, I had a uh, private client who wanted to do uh, some good uh, during the Kosovo war. And, you know, he was watching the refugees on TV every night. And there was, you know, ethnic cleansing in Kosovo. And so I went to Kosovo a couple of times. Uh, I talked him into doing a humanitarian project there to finance it, and he did. And so I went there and, and set it up and got it going. And it was handed off to the International Rescue Committee. And anyway, this, pro this humanitarian project evolved into a very successful, profitable business. It didn't belong to me, but it was sort of my idea. And, uh, and, I, and it was in a post-war zone where they needed uh, the goods and services that this guy could provide. So I said, you know what, that's a good business model. So when I knew that uh, Iraq was going to happen, uh, I decided to do the same thing in Iraq that we had done in Kosovo, but this time it would be my business. So I borrowed some money, uh, got a couple of guys who had uh, absolutely nothing else to do <laughs> with their time and convinced them to go to uh, Baghdad with me. I had uh, uh, an Iraqi partner tribal leader from Ramadi, uh, because you, you know, yeah, one thing I learned in the CIA far. is you can't get anything done anywhere without good local partner asset, whatever you want to call them. And so that way, it was, as soon as we, uh, saw that mission accomplished, uh, sign up on, on the ship, uh, we said, all right, peace is broken <laughs> out. We're going to go in. And we did, we thought we'd have like a, maybe a two or three month jumps, a head start on the competition. Uh, but it ended up being many years because, you know, obviously the insurgency uh, quickly sprang up. And that all these stories are covered in the book as well. But but that's how I got into it. It was based on a, something I had done in Kosovo before. Uh, and it was purely private, had nothing to do with the U.S. government. However, as I mentioned in the book, uh, the U.S. government, which initially told me I couldn't do it, shouldn't do it, and you know, I forget what else they said. Uh, they said the same thing when I went to Kosovo, and they ended up becoming our customer there. Right. So I, I ignored them, and they heard, first of all, because they thought, how can a former CIA guy get away with this in Iraq? It's, and I said, it ain't going to be easy, but, you know, you do the best you can, and you keep it quiet, and we're an Iraqi company, and, and you know, people, and we have all Iraqi employees, and we, we cover all regions of Iraq and little white Iraqi cars. There's no uh, private convoy for us. We couldn't afford it anyway. And so we were operating anywhere and everywhere from day one, and the U.S. government got wind of it and said, hey, you could help us with our uh, counterterrorism mission because you can do things and go places 
that we can't do. And again, I can't get into the detail, but it was a, a highly successful program for many years, uh, countrywide, and uh, they pulled the plug on it when troops left Iraq at the end of 2011, even though it was supposed to be a stay-behind program, and it had, was unbelievably successful, and it had been kept secret. Uh, and a lot of us inside and outside of the government said, uh, "What do you, you know, don't pull the plug on it. This is now is when we need it. The bad guys have not gone away. They're not going to go away. Right. But they did. But they did. And so I, you know, my business continued to operate. Uh, and then a couple of years later, when uh, ISIS took over Mosul, and our business was operating in Mosul as always, with ISIS permission, eventually. Uh, again, they didn't know it was an American-run company. Uh, and I reminded my friends in the government that we're operational in Mosul, and according to the news, you guys don't know anything about what's happening in Mosul. You were caught off guard by ISIS. You probably wouldn't have been if you had not pulled the plug on the program. But would you like to reactivate the program now, uh, since you know this is ISIS occupation? And the bottom line answer was, no thanks. <laughs> It was yeah, a sort of friend of mine him. at uh, Soxent at that time when we, when we were withdrawing, and he was telling me about that, how we like literally shut down all of our intelligence networks in Iraq, and they were shocked. They were like, we've never done anything like this before, yeah. just like pulling the plug on something this large. I, yeah, I feel like the uh, – I mean this is habitual for the United States government though in, in, the, in the sense that yeah. we, we're blind to what's going on in the world unless like – we have some knee-jerk reaction or some interest in it, whether it's political interest, economic interest, whatever else. And then we go in and we have we start from zero. Uh, almost every time we go into some place, they have to reactivate. You know, like when we went into Af Afghanistan, they had to reactivate guys who had been working with the Mooj against the Russians because we had, we had nothing there. We kept nothing there. We kept no assets, no resources, nothing. We, we remained blind in areas until it's like, oh, no, something's happening. You know, let's spin something right. up. Well, why do you think that is, yeah. HK? Why, why, why do we have such a, you, and you mentioned it in the Balkans also, that we had this like schizophrenic foreign policy. Why, why do you think we behave like that from a policy standpoint? You know, I, I pin a lot of it on the politicians. You know, uh, the first George Bush in the Balkans and James Baker, Secretary of State, they, they had good intentions. They wanted to hold Yugoslavia together the way Tito had because we knew that civil war was the alternative. The way but, we wanted to hold Iraq together. Right, but it was the it, same thing. Exactly. I compare exactly. uh, Saddam to Tito quite often, because like he's almost a necessary evil in that part of the world. Um, you know? Exactly, exactly. In fact, when we first went into Iraq, I immediately set up an office in Basra, Baghdad, and, uh, and Kurdistan, because I looked at it through the Yugoslav lens, I thought, this place is going to fall apart eventually. Now they haven't quite yet, but um, but that was my thought. And then you know when they when it was the Obama administration that pulled the plug on uh, on our program, and I don't know who made the decision. I don't know if it was made at the agency level or the White House. Who knows? But you know, in that case, he had promised to get us out of Iraq, and so maybe it was based on that. I you know I, it's hard to figure out why they do things because. In the scheme of things, it didn't cost much to run our program. You know, probably cost a lot less than a single uh, missile. And um, so why not keep the damn thing going, you know? And it, it very well could have helped predict the uh, the rise of, of ISIS, you know, because we were everywhere, Ramadi and Mosul, Fallujah, you name it, we were there. And um, anyway, they, they pulled the plug and never, and never reactivated it. So I, it, it never made any sense to me. I got one more question, unless the audience has anything or you have anything, Dave. Uh, no, uh, Andrew, uh, thanks, Andrew, again. Uh, he uh, just made a comment. He said that uh, Will Durant said, no civilization is conquered from without before it has destroyed itself from within. And, I mean, that, there, there's a lot of truth to that. And, you know, I think he's commenting on our discussion about our, our divisive politics right now, you know, and the tribalism right. that we're starting to see in America. Right. Well, wasn't it Lenin? I think it was Lenin or some old Soviet leader who said that they will they will take America without firing a shot. Right. 
And and uh, the there's that fascinating interview with the old KGB uh, agent on YouTube where he says that, that their policy basically succeeded. That you know they introduced Marxism into the colleges, into the educational system, and now it's just a matter of watching as as it takes its course. You know whether it's based on class warfare or identity warfare or or whatever, but some way to stop. Americans from seeing themselves as Americans, but as as some sort of class to right. do battle with the other classes. Right. I mean, that's it's nothing new that the Russians are doing this. The Soviets did the same thing. What's what's new is I think that we have sort of given them the tools, like Facebook and other things, right, to use against us, almost free. You know, it's yeah. just they, we've given them more than they can possibly use against us. HK, I'm going to. Uh, ask you to stay for a private or a, a, a separate segment for our supporters. There's a couple other stories I want to ask you about potentially recruiting a KGB officer or something you were involved in, which is really interesting. And, um, and we'll see if we have time for anything else, because I know we've already kept you for like two hours. But before we end the stream tonight, I just wanted to ask you, war in the Balkans in the 2020s, what do you place your odds at? In in the Balkans, in the Balkans, yeah. What what do you mean? I mean, do you think war is coming back to that region? Is it going to happen again? You know, I, I honestly don't follow it that closely uh, anymore. I still have friends there that I speak with, although we don't talk about politics that much. I hope, you know, I hope not. And I, uh, I know there's still tension in places like uh, like Bosnia. Um, but I really don't keep up with it that much. So I, I hope they wouldn't go back to that that path again because it's just uh, no good comes from it, as you know. Absolutely. Guys, the book is American Spy, written by our guest H.K. Roy. Uh, I mean, we've talked about it for two hours at this point. You have a pretty good idea about, you know, what his experience is and what he's done. But there's a lot more in this book. I mean, we barely covered his experiences in Iraq, which is like the whole second half of the book. So I definitely recommend going and picking this up. Yeah, please, please uh, read the book. Um, first off, thank you, everybody, for the birthday wishes. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, another question Alex said, asked, what advice would HK give to someone trying to join the CIA? And what was your favorite meal in the Balkans? <laughs> uh, the, that's an excellent question. Both are excellent questions. And I, uh, I wrote a lot of the book with young people in mind, people who might be thinking about joining the CIA. Uh, the good news is you can do so much more research on it now than you could when I joined. And so get online. The CIA has a fantastic website where you can learn about all the different jobs. They have internships for kids in college, so you can be exposed to it that way. Uh, so I would start off with the CIA website, uh, and as well as just sort of researching what you can online. But um, you know, there's no. I think you need a college degree, and there are a lot of different jobs at the CIA. You don't have to be an operations officer like I was. They're all different. I mean, any any job you can think of. It's almost like the military. There's a place for you there. Uh, a lot of them are based in D.C., obviously. Uh, if you want to go overseas, then you, you should become a, a case officer, an operations officer, which to me is the best, most important job at the CIA anyway. Why why join to do anything else? But uh, that's just my own bias. But, yeah, get online, go to their website, and look into all the different types of job descriptions. And, and it's a good, fair process. You know, they will – You it's, it's not based on who you know like it may have been in the old days. It's you know based on your qualifications, and they look for people from all different backgrounds, all different parts of the world, all different kinds of languages. Obviously, uh, it's not it's not a requirement to have a foreign language to join, but it obviously helps if you've got one, especially one that they're interested in. As for my favorite meal in the Balkans, I like the uh, I was in Serbia, which so there was a lot of it was kind of like Russian food. You know, there was not a lot of vegetables and. Uh, to this day, I can't get enough salad after having lived there. But there's something called a shopska salata, which is like a, kind of like a Greek salad. And so a lot of the Turkish in, uh, influence, uh, although the Serbs complain about it, uh, the best food uh, had the Turkish influence. The shopska salata, cevapcici, are basically like little uh, kofta kebabs, you know, minced meat uh, on the grill. 
uh, that was that that was my favorite stuff was all the the Turkish uh, the Turkish based food. Did you have a, a hard time um, with PRB getting your book published? Not too bad. I had I had been through the process once before with chapter one, which I had published as an article. Although chapter one is much, it's twice as long as the article was, so it's a lot more in depth. I, I knew more or less what I could and couldn't say. I also went to D. I go to D.C. every year for a, a fundraiser called Spook Stock, which I mentioned at the, at the back of the book. It's a fundraiser for the CIA uh, Officers Memorial Foundation and for uh, Special Ops Warrior Foundation, something like that. I can I can give you the websites later. But while I was there, I went in to meet with PRB because it's always better to meet face to face if you can. And so we sort of went over the outline of the book, and they gave me guidance on what I could and couldn't say. And, uh, you know, at first it seemed like impossible hurdles to overcome, but then I figured out ways, and they were helpful, ways to uh, to work around some of the things that they had uh, issues with. And so, you know, for the most part, it, was, it wasn't too bad of a process. And I wasn't able to tell uh, with as much detail, like the story that I was just talking about in Iraq, where we had this fantastic, successful counterterrorism program, which they pulled the plug on. Uh, but, you know, there are reasons why I, I can't tell the whole story, and it, and it makes perfect sense. And who knows, maybe someday we'll reactivate it. Uh, but for the most part, it was fair. But I've heard other people who say it, it, was, it was a pretty bad experience. So I guess it just sort of depends on, you know, your, your experience. Yeah. Well, uh, would, you, uh, would you mention the name of that charity again? You know, I'm going to read it to you. Correct. I'm going to get out of the back of my book here. There's two. The the, the fundraiser is called Spook Stock. There's not a lot on it online. It's sort of like a secret fundraiser, which they have every year, and they, it's a battle of the bands. And they have it's like a private concert. Like this past year, we had Lenny Kravitz, we've had uh, ZZ Top, uh, Steve Miller Band, John Fogerty. And, they, and we have celebrity judges sometimes who will judge this amateur battle of the bands. Robert De Niro's been there. Harvey Keitel, he, who was a Marine in Vietnam, I didn't know that. He was a celebrity judge. Admiral McRaven was a celebrity judge once. And so, but it, it, it's a fundraiser for the children of, of fallen CIA and special operations uh, military. And I'm just looking really quickly to see if I can find it. Here we go. The websites are ciamemorialfoundation.org and specialops.org if anybody is inclined to make a donation to a very worthy cause. Uh, there are usually you know, a dozen or two dozen new kids every year. Yeah. They, they, they pay for the, uh, the college education for the kids, but also they provide just a lot of guidance that the missing parent uh, would have been providing had they, had they survived. Yeah. Uh, there's also, uh, I believe... The thirdoption.org is is another one. Um, There's a, yeah, they actually added uh, I think DIA to Spook Stock, and I don't have their website, but there's a DIA fundraiser as well connected to it. But yeah, lots of good causes, that's for sure, and, and yeah. not enough money to to go around. Right. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, do CIA doctors ever go on operations? I don't know. I mean. Uh, I, I would think so. You know, I didn't have that much contact with them um, other than at headquarters. Um, you know, but since 9-11, you know, things have changed a lot since I was, was in. And, and uh, so I, I can't really say for sure. I just don't know. You know, there are polygraph operators and there are others like psychologists who get involved with agent debriefings and agent assessments and that kind of thing. Uh, but I never personally worked with the CIA doctor overseas. One could speculate, especially if they listen to this live stream podcast show, that there are uh, contractors that work for the Central Intelligence Agency who may be special forces qualified medics or even doctors who are out in operational environments. That's very possible. It's a possibility. Right. Yeah, especially since 9-11. Yeah. Since there's there's been a... a a militarization of the CIA, as you guys know, uh, and a lot of uh, blurring of the lines between spies and soldiers uh, since 9/11 as well. Do you do you have an opinion on the the militar militarization of the CIA as you see it? I mean, 
Do you feel it that it's an area that that they should be in, shouldn't be in? Do you have a sort of a personal take on it? You know, I kind of go back and forth on that, and I, and I I've been out since 9/11, and so I I can't say with any great authority, you know, that it's a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, I understand how things evolved that way, but part of me thinks that you know the CIA should focus on traditional espionage that's their that's their job is they're the the foreign clandestine service of the united states and the pentagon uh, should handle anything uh military obviously there's some overlap you know look at the drone program and things like that sure. but and i'm not an expert on on what's been happening there since 9 11 but just my gut tells me that cia should focus more on their their core uh mission which is foreign clandestine intelligence so when you say that, you mean more sort of at the strategic level and you feel, do you, I mean, do you feel that militarizing it uh, makes it too, makes the information or makes, makes the activity too tactical, too small scale and, and doesn't focus on, on what their main mission is? Yeah. And, and again, I understand why they went down that path because, you know, a lot of CIA to Afghanistan and Iraq, and so it's there were war zones, and so it kind of made sense. But there's a whole, you know, if you take out Afghanistan and Iraq, and you look at the rest of the world, uh, you don't need the military uh, training to work as a CIA officer for the most part, you know. Right. Um, so I, I understand how they got into that into that business, but you know, it wasn't from what I've heard about how they handled assets in Iraq, you know. You, you go out with a team of guys and you bring them back to the embassy or wherever and debrief them and you know it's it's a lot different from from how we did things in the cold in the cold war where sure you're one guy you know one guy you do it you know you make it or break it but um uh and then there's that story which i know you know about uh how the, it was in it was in uh, zero dark 30 uh where the cia brought in the the, somebody they thought was going to be an Al Qaeda uh, oh, that's volunteer, Bob uh, Chapman. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so the way that was handled was was not good. You know, in the right. old days, even in a situation like that, you'd probably send a case officer out on his own to meet with a guy and you know and hope for the best. And not, I mean, maybe bring somebody with you, but you wouldn't bring him into a place like that. And um, and I, and I don't mean to second guess what they were doing because I wasn't there and I don't know, but I know they're, you know, the, I don't know that the person in charge was even a case officer and uh, to bring somebody in like that with, without basic, you know, patting him down and oh, right. what the hell. It just, from what I, from what I heard about it, I, I couldn't believe that they did it that way. You know, it was a, a horrible tragedy too. Uh, and uh, some of those Children are beneficiaries of Spookstock uh, as well, but um, yeah, I don't know what the answer is, you know. And like I said, I, I understand why they went down that path, but it seems like there's a lot of overlap and confusion as a result. Yeah. And one last question. Uh, one last question. Um, and thank you again, Alex. Uh, did HK ever work with CI Maritime or Air Branch? No, I did not. We we received both maritime and air branch training during SOTSI, which was a hell of a lot of fun. But no, I had nothing. I was not a paramilitary officer, and so I had uh, I, I did not work with uh, with those guys. Great. Well, guys, thank you very much. Thank you, HK. We really, really appreciate your time. Um, nice. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, please make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, share this video if you enjoyed it. Uh, make sure you hit your notification button and subscribe to all notifications um, and then YouTube will decide uh, arbitrarily whether it notifies you or not. Um, thanks for the birthday wishes and please uh, join us on Patreon for special content. Leave, so, leave a comment, give us a little thumbs yeah, up. Yeah, leave a comment, uh, give us a thumbs up. Um, Jack said that he will name his firstborn male after the person who <laughs> leaves the most comments uh, in the first year. So. Raise a glass for Dave and his big 5-0. Cheers. So, <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks again. Thanks, HGX. Thank you, guys.